I'm here with Dr. Andrew Nelson, who is an instrument scientist at the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, Hayden Robertson, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Newcastle, and Dr. Isaac Gresham, who is a recent PhD graduate from the University of New South Wales. Thank you all very much for joining me. Pleasure. Thank you. So my first question is, what is a polymer brush? Yeah, so it might be easiest to answer that question by explaining how you might make a polymer brush. Uh, so you take a polymer, which is just a long molecule, and you attach that to a surface by one of its ends. Um, now, if that's solvated, so in a liquid uh, that will wiggle around, you could imagine that that's somewhat similar to a piece of seaweed, um, you know, floating off, floating by itself on the seafloor. Um, but to make a brush, we tether lots of these polymers uh, close together uh, so that their, uh, their volume starts to interact with each other. Uh, and this forces the, the seaweed or the polymers uh, away from the substrate, so they stretch up. Um, and it's this, this structure, this brushy structure, that gives these polymer brush layers uh, their interesting properties like lubricity or anti -fatling. Hayden, why are you interested in studying them? Yeah, these polymer brush systems are really interesting and they have loads of applications, whether that be from targeted drug delivery all the way through to anti-fouling coatings. So I guess we need to have a really good understanding of the behavior of these systems. Um, for example, in lots of different salts or different solvents as behavior of these polymer brushes is really affected by what environment that they're in. So I guess one particular reason that we're really interested in these polymer brushes is that they're a great system to investigate the effect of an iron on, on a system, or in this case, what we call specific iron effects. So that might be, for example, in the presence of one iron like chloride, it might cause the brush to collapse. So kind of taking away the water from the seaweed like Isaac was talking about, you would just like the seaweed would just collapsing on the ocean floor. But another, um, in the presence of another iron like thiocyanate, um, the brush might actually swell more than in the absence of this iron. So we can really tailor the brush conformation or how the brush sits depending on what particular ions are present. And this drastically changes the behavior of the polymer. So the, I guess the behavior of the polymer is really well known in particular systems or simple systems rather like water or just a single salt. But as a whole, the current understanding of how these brushes work in complicated systems or just more natural systems is really limited. So where that's what we're interested in looking at, the behavior of the brush in these complicated systems with lots of different salts or they might be different solvents as well. And this is really important because I guess nature isn't just ever water. There's lots of other things at play here. So to go forward to potential applications, we really need to be coming up with a predictive theory on how these brushes will behave in these complex environments. The applications you mentioned, what sorts of things could we possibly be using them for? Yeah, so I mentioned um, targeted drug delivery as one of them. So we might be able to encapsulate a particular drug um, in these polymers and we might have a special type of polymer which might be responsive to different environments. So we might have a temperature responsive polymer. So that means that we can call cause it to swell or collapse. So that might be taking the water away from it. Um, so the seaweed kind of collapses depending on its temperature. And we also might have one what's called a pH adjusted polymer. So depending on how acidic the environment it's in um, depends on the conformation. And if the polymers are standing up away from the substrate or if they're collapsing in. So we might be able to um, use these polymers as a delivery vehicle to transport drugs to a particular part of the body. So for example, um, some particular cancers have a significantly lower pH um, environment relative to the rest of the body. So we might wanna use a pH responsive polymer um, in order to control the um, drug release and also transport the drug to that particular part of the body instead of just um, giving the drug to the whole body in that sense. Cool, thank you. Andrew, how are polymer brushes being studied at ANSTER? Well, at ANSTER, we have a large range of uh, landmark infrastructure uh, that's useful for making nanostructural characterizations. And these 
uh, polymer brushes. Uh, we're interested in uh, structure at the nanometer length scale. So that's one millionth of a millimeter. So really very, very small. And at Anstow, we have a wide variety of instrumentation. We have X-rays, uh, X-ray scattering at the Australian synchrotron and uh, neutron scattering at the Opal reactor at Anstow in Sydney. My work at Anstow involves uh, reflecting beams of neutrons off surfaces, uh, just like a laser beam reflects off a mirror. By measuring how the neutrons reflect as a function of angle, uh, we can tell something about the uh, structure of the interface. Um, and so the equivalent using light would be, say, if you had a, an oil film on water, the color that you see is caused by the constructive and destructive interference of different wavelengths of light as they reflect off the surface. And the color that you see uh, will be related to the thickness and also the refractive index of the oil film. Uh, and there's a neutron analog, uh, neutron reflectometry. It's pretty much uh, very, very similar uh, in terms of operations to uh, light reflection. Um, you know, we have a, a technique called neutron reflection. Uh, we have uh, two instruments at ANSTO that can do this, uh, both based at uh, Lucas Sites in Sydney. And neutron reflection is pretty much the only technique where we can look at the, the detailed nanostructure of these polymer chains. This detailed structure is called the polymer volume refraction profile, which basically tells you the concentration of the polymer perpendicular to the interface. And using uh, neutron reflection, we can track what happens to this, uh, this, this concentration profile as a function of temperature, or as a function of pH, uh, or as a, a function of confinement. And uh, using reflection, we can look at a variety of interfaces, such as the air-liquid interface, solid-liquid interface, or uh, an air-solid interface. With these polymer brushes, we're looking at uh, solid-liquid interfaces where you, you have your polymer brush uh, grafted to a solid surface, and then you have liquid against that. Um, but air-liquids, air-liquid interfaces are of uh, interest in the lungs, for example. And at Ansto, we have uh, a special cell that we use for a lot of these kinds of um, these kinds of studies, and a special modification by making various uh, modifications to this. Uh, UNSW uh, were able to make a confinement cell, and a confinement cell. Uh, this is what we've been doing in uh, a proportion of our research is where you bring. Uh, two surfaces close to each other. And instead of your polymer brush uh, experiencing, um, I guess, kind of an infinite liquid, they're now starting to be confined by another surface. And those kinds of confinement experiments are really interesting because uh, they're, you've, you find them in a lot of uh, tribological situations. Tribology is the study of uh, two surfaces sliding against each other. So it's of interest in friction. Um, and so we, uh, we have a good collaboration formed with UNSW in Newcastle that's developing these cells that we can then put on our beam lines. And we're also uh, world-class at Amstone performing a, a lot of uh, certain types of kinetic measurements. So we've looked at uh, these brushes polymerizing in real time. So you're looking at these uh, seaweed chains growing in length. Um, and we were also world experts in developing software for analysis of these kinds of uh, data sets, so neutron reflection data sets. Great, thanks. What have each of you learned so far from this research collaboration and what more are you hoping to find out? I'll, pro I'll go first then. <laughs> So uh, one of the um, key things that we've been, uh, I've been involved with uh, is verifying the robustness of the reflection technique for characterizing polymer brushes. Uh, so developing analysis tools, various methodologies for uh, getting the uncertainties in our system. So how sure can we be that a certain structure uh, is correct? 
Um, neutron reflection has been used for analyzing polymer brushes for a long time, um, since the technique's inception in, I don't know, I guess the late 70s, early 80s. Um, but what we've done is uh, we've rigorously looked into how good a, a technique it would be. Uh, so that's one thing that I've been particularly interested in over the last few years. Um, yeah, so we, we've really learned a lot um, through this collaboration and it just hasn't been a recent collaboration either. There's been um, lots of students before me who have uh, really come along and done the hard yards and the real foundational work. So studying um, the behaviour of these polymer brushes um, just just, just in border and really understanding their mechanisms and how they function um, so that we can really come in now and have a look at the more complex regimes. So where they have may have looked at um, the behaviour of these polymer brushes in the absence of salt um, or just even a single electrolyte. Um, now we're looking at more complex um, environments where we have um, the mixed salts, like I mentioned before, and also different solvents as well. So looking at the behaviour of the brush in different liquids um, and this is really important to be able to come together with that all-inclusive predictive theory, um, which is the overall aim of the project. And also working with computational chemists from um, here at the University of Newcastle, and they're simulating um, all these different environments as well and seeing how those results align with the results we get at ANSTO. Cool. Isaac? Yeah, um, so Andy somewhat alluded to this uh, before, um, but as I, as I mentioned, uh, polymer brushes tend to be quite slippery. Uh, so naturally, there's an interest to use them as lubricating surfaces. Uh, nature already does this, for instance, in your knee, um, brush-like uh, lubricin proteins coat your kneecaps and enable uh, smooth knee motion, even under significant pressure. Um, so what's interesting, there's two interesting things uh, about, I suppose, these brushes when we use them to lubricate. Um, firstly, uh, the properties of these brushes, and we've seen this throughout all our research, and this is reasonably, this is well known, the properties of these brushes aren't just chemical, they also stem from their structure. So um, we could use these same polymers without the brush configuration, and they would have completely different uh, interfacial properties. Um, the second thing is that when you want a surface to be lubricating, it's often also being squished. So think about your knees. When you're standing up, when you're running, um, you, your knee is under tremendous pressure, but it also, you also want it to be slippery. Well, lubricate. Um, so what, we're, what we do, uh, and neutron reflectometry is really the only technique that is available to study this sort of system and to perform these sort of experiments, what we do uh, is we examine the structure of the polymer brush um, using the technique that uh, Andrew detailed earlier um, in a special cell where we're able to squish the layer. So we're able to ex examine its structure and also squish it. Um, so we can uh, get a good feeling uh, for the link between the structure of the layer and the properties that we're expecting it to have. Um, this is actually the, the baby of my PhD supervisor, Dr. Stuart Prescott. Um, so I should mention, mention him there. Uh, but this, yeah, this enables, this apparatus really enables us an unparalleled insight into the structure of these confined layers. Uh, now, what I've learned from that is that these layers are really easy to squish. Uh, no matter what polymer we use, um, uh, no matter what additives, what ions we put, we put in there, uh, we've, what we've found is that we've been able to compress these layers really easily at much lower stresses than would be found, for instance, in your knee. Um, uh, so this has led to a, a series of new questions being formed. Um, so what questions like, what exactly is it about this brush geometry that makes them so slippery? And do they really need to be swollen to lubricate? Um, and if so, why is nature so much better at making uh, these brushy layers that remain swollen at incredible pressures uh, than, than we are um, synthetically in our laboratories? Um, so it's these questions that have been raised by our current research. And it's these questions that we'd really like to, uh, to keep digging into um, going forward. Cool, thanks. Uh, is there anything else that any of you would like to add? I think I'd have to add, probably add that it's been one of the most fruitful collaborations that I've been involved with as a professional scientist. 
Um, it's it's just re it's really good when you have several groups from different universities and research organizations working together and when you've got really enthusiastic PhD students and honours students and uh, chief investigators, you can really get a, a whole amount done. Thank you all very much for your time.